Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to the Dementia Care Aware webinar for this month, April. We are pleased to present to you the topic for this month, which is adapting the cognitive health assessment for patients with hearing or vision impairment, limited literacy or illiteracy, and non-English speakers. We're incredibly pleased to also welcome Dr. Sergio Lanata, who's our speaker today, and I'll be helping moderate, as I often have in the past. Um, let's go to the next slide. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm Anna Chodos, uh, Executive Director of Dementia Care Aware and in Geriatrics and Primary Care, an Associate Professor at UCSF. And our speaker today is Dr. Lanata, who's an Associate Professor of Clinical Neurology here at UCSF. He's the Director of the UCSF Memory and Aging Center Community Outreach Program and a practicing clinician. Next slide, please. We, neither of us have any financial disclosures to make. And next slide. And just as we're getting started and people are trickling in, um, we like to remind everybody of our Dementia Careware program and the program offerings that we have. We have a warm line, which is up and running, open nine to five, Monday through Friday for clinical consultation questions. And we have ongoing trainings. We have our core training online. I'll show you another uh, slide to remind you of that. Um, and we have other online modules coming out this year, um, starting in June, um, all of which will have continuing education and continuing medical education credits. We have these monthly webinars and we have podcasts now. We have interactive case conferences. You can sign up for those as well. If you go to our website, um, we have e their ECHO case conferences hosted by UCLA and UC Irvine teams. And then we have practice support opportunities. If you happen to be a clinician or an administrator who's in a practice that's really interested in implementing dementia care and dementia screening and care, these are hands-on coaching programs to help your clinic do that. So I encourage you to just reach out to us anytime. There's no wrong way through our email or via our website. You'll also find information to contact us about any of these opportunities. Next slide, please. So just a reminder that our online training for the cognitive health assessment is available at DementiaCareWare.org. It has the continuing education credits and it's self-guided, so you can do it anytime. And total, you can get uh, 1.5 credits. And we really encourage it. It's sort of the, the basis of our program. And if you've done the training, then you can bill for providing the service if you are a billing provider with Medi-Cal. Um, next slide, please. So we also like, since a lot of these webinars are about the CHA, the Cognitive Health Assessment, which is our screening approach, we like to remind everybody of its components. It is new. And so we want to make sure people have the opportunity to learn about it and to remember it um, since it's a new thing. Uh, it has the familiar component of doing a direct cognitive assessment. But as you'll see, the Cognitive Health Assessment, which is recommended as a screen for our patients 65 and older, who do not already carry a diagnosis of dementia, includes the first part of taking a brief history, the second, which is to apply screening tools for cognition and function, and the third would be to document care partner information. And the advantage we think of this is other than it's brief, it gives us a little bit more information, and if people are positive, meaning they have a positive finding on the screen, it allows us to start a brain health plan at the earliest sign of symptoms. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So just a refresher, when we say take a patient history, we really mean take a very brief patient history. And this is because a lot of our clinics already ask patients or have an annual screen about a myriad of things. And so many of them have a question about memory or thinking. For example, have you or your friends or family noted changes in your mental abilities? So it, really brief history. So that would be a yes or no. Next. And then we give some options for screening tools that include the ability to involve an informant in getting that screening done. And the goal really is to get some objective information with a validated tool about the patient's cognition and function. Next slide. And finally, documenting a care partner. And the reason this comes up in a very early screen is so that we can start to understand the person's support system since it will likely be critical in working with that patient. So we give some examples of how you could ask about that. Is there someone who supports you with your medical care or someone who supports you with your daily care or needs? Or do you have a documented durable power of attorney for healthcare? 
And then of course we recommend documenting that in a place where you or others might find it in the chart. So now that I've reviewed the CHA, I'm shortly gonna hand it over to Dr. Lenata to do the presentation on adapting the CHA. And just a quick reminder, um, you can put questions and comments in the Q&A. I will be monitoring it throughout, and then I'll batch our questions at the end. Today, we're going to have quite a few opportunities for a rich discussion, I think, with the topics that come up, and I think we'll have plenty of time, so really looking forward to that. Please don't hesitate to put your comments there. And then at the very end, you'll also get the information for how to claim your education credits and um, other opportunities to interact with the program. So thank you so much. I'm so pleased to turn it over to Dr. Lenata, and um, I'll be watching your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, these are the main learning objectives for today. Uh, we're gonna try to highlight different approaches that will allow you to do a CHA in the setting of meeting a person, a patient that doesn't speak English or someone that has sensory impairments low literacy and other barriers too that may impede your ability to conduct the CHA the way we should. Um, just a little bit of background here. Uh, we're talking about patient level barriers that may, or patient level characteristics, let's say, that may uh, function as barriers to you conducting a CHA. And we're just gonna highlight a few of them. Um, obviously we're talking about a statewide effort and, and um, we're going to miss a lot of barriers. So in the discussion, I hope that other people bring up other challenges that you perceive in your practice so we can have a conversation about these too. But, you know, for example, hearing loss, which is an obvious barrier to conducting any clinical evaluation, but very important to uh, conducting a cognitive screen is very common in, in our state and in the country. About, about a third of people above the age of 65 have some degree of, of hearing loss. Um, it gets more prevalent the older we get. Uh, vision impairment, also an important barrier, pretty uh, uh, clearly um, uh, detrimental barrier when you're doing, a, for example, a cognitive screening, also very common in people as we age. Uh, it's estimated that, that up to a third of people over the age of 71 may have some degree of vision impairment that is gonna affect your ability to conduct a cognitive screen. There's also intellectual and learning disabilities. Um, uh, we just mentioned the, the association between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, which is very well known clinically and in the, in the, in the research world uh, to highlight that as a characteristic that can serve as a barrier to conducting a, a cognitive health assessment. And in our state, the issue of uh, English not being the primary language is very prevalent, right? Uh, in California, among those 65 and older, uh, about 37% of uh, speak a language other than English at home, and 24% of these speak English less than very well. So that's a lot of people, and that's a huge barrier to conducting clinical assessments in general, but very important to conducting a, a cognitive health assessment as well. We're going to talk about some of these. Also to highlight, um, a uh, unfortunate and scientifically interested, re interesting relationship. When we think, for example, of hearing loss, it is now well recognized that hearing loss is an important risk factor to the development of uh, late life neurodegenerative disease and dementia. Um, and so are all of these other risk factors, most of which are um, modifiable. And it's estimated that by addressing these modifiable risk factors at a population level, we could potentially prevent up to 40% of cases of dementia, of neurodegenerative uh, illness. Uh, other, I wanna highlight others that are both a risk factor and also a barrier to conducting a CHA, like low educational attainment, low health literacy. Uh, we already talked about hearing loss, uh, mental illness, depression has made it up to this list, clinical depression, that can also be a barrier when conducting a CHA, not only because severe cases of depression can sometimes present themselves as cognitive in, or with cognitive impairment, but also because people that have that are in the midst of a psychiatric crisis are going to be very difficult to engage with. And I think it's, it's our responsibility to try to find creative ways of engaging uh, with people regardless of their circumstances so we can get a good cognitive assessment. And that's, that's part of the, the, um, the, the goal or the, the mission that we want to put out. 
This is a recent study <clears throat> around associations of hearing loss and, um, and onset of dementia late in life. It seems to be a very powerful risk factor for neurodegenerative disease. We don't know exactly how uh, this link happens. It could be through a mediator of uh, diminished cognitive stimulation if you're hearing impaired uh, that accumulates over many years and you become less cognitively stimulated, which we know that cognitive stimulation is also a risk factor for developing cognitive impairment and dementia. Also, as background, it's important to understand that and to always have in mind that the overarching goal of the CHA is to help us diagnose people that have mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Now, the way to think of these, of these uh, designations of MCI and dementia is to look at them in the setting of the natural history of these neurodegenerative diseases. I'm just picking Alzheimer's here because it's the most common. Uh, but we understand now that people that live with this disease go through a very long natural history where initially even people are asymptomatic, meaning there's already uh, the neuro neuropathologic process is already emerging in the brain, but they don't notice anything. Physicians don't notice anything. Family members don't notice anything. But we can now tap into that neuropathology through biomarkers. And it's not until later that a person enters a stage that we call subjective cognitive decline, where there's already something that the person is perceiving as different, but still they're scoring well on cognitive assessments, they're functionally fine, and really nobody's too worried about this. And it's not until later that they enter a stage called mild cognitive impairment, where there's already the awareness that something has changed from baseline. This change can be substantiated by cognitive testing, but it's still not severe enough to affect day-to-day -day life. And that state of MCI is different from dementia in that in, when somebody reaches a stage of dementia, uh, by definition, they have um, a loss of independence in day-to-day -day activities. So I put this slide first to make us aware that uh, there's a, dis a distinction and a difference between having MCI and dementia and the, and the underlying etiology or the underlying cause of such MCI and dementia syndrome. What we're trying to accomplish through the CHA is to help providers identify these stages of illness, um, sort of divorced or, or uh, uh, without asking you to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease as the cause or as at another neurodegenerative disease as the cause. We think that as a first step, we need to be aware of the natural history and learn how to identify people on these stages. Uh, and this is basically what the DSM-5 um, recommends, basically. And, and you know, this is a, a longer explanation of our, what I already mentioned in the DSM-5. MCI is called mild neurocognitive disorder. Dementia is called major neurocognitive disorder. And like I said, uh, people with MCI or mild neurocognitive disorders are, are still are, are those that have cognitive changes. They can be substantiated, but they're still conducting themselves relatively independently in day-to-day -day life. And they're asking us to make sure that you're not assigning mild cognitive impairment to someone that is delirious and or someone that has a psychiatric illness uh, that uh, could be presented itself as a neurocognitive disorder. And the only difference with between MCI and dementia really, really boils down to the functional abilities. And so when you think about this, then if you want to do a good basic screen of cognitive health, uh, you have to include those three elements, which is why the CHA is focusing on those three elements, history, functional abilities, and screens, screens of cognition, um, and, and well, as I already said, the screen of functional abilities. So those are the three basic elements that you need in order to stratify uh, where your patient stands on that continuum of impairment before you even think of what is the underlying cause. If you think it's AD, if you think it's vascular disease, meaning like a vascular form of dementia, et cetera. And just to further um, uh, bring this point home, the DSM-5 now has this classification, right, that you can first assign someone as having major neurocognitive disorder, for example, and you can choose if you think it's due to Alzheimer's or due to frontotemporal lobal degeneration or due to Parkinson's disease and all of these other conditions that can lead to a mild and major neurocognitive disorder. So to start off here, uh, and now with that background, 
I think this point is extremely important as we learn about the CHA and as we conduct uh, cognitive health evaluations in the clinic, that you have to keep yourself flexible in the sense that um, we, are, we are talking about a series of steps or components that need to be addressed, but you have ample flexibility in how you conduct each component. Flexibility in the way of, in, in the sense of how you um, ask about functional abilities, flexibility in, the, in how you test cognition. Uh, you know, we're fully aware that some providers in the state may be very comfortable using the MOCA, others the MINICOG and, and a whole slew of other cognitive, brief cognitive tests that, that exists out there. Um, and so we're okay with that, right? It's more about doing something consistently over time that will allow you to measure not only a baseline on your patient, but also how that person changes through time using the same instruments or using the same approach. Is that change that is going to let you determine, you know, does this person really have a neurodegenerative disorder, for example, or, or what is this? What is driving it? Aside from doing a, a diagnosis test, test that, that you may be comfortable doing in your clinic. So as you've heard, right, the, the three components are taking a brief history, using tools, especially cognitive screening tools that I mentioned, doing a functional screen. Uh, we, are, we are talking about doing a functional screen sort of in, an, in a history, in an interview-like fashion, but there are also brief screens, structured screens that you can do, that you can use to, to collect um, an assessment of functional abilities. And the third piece of the CHA is to document a, a care partner, which is going to be extremely important down the road for those patients that are in the midst of a neurodegenerative disease. And you want to make sure early on they have someone by their side that you can rely on for all kinds of things that may happen in the future. So just to put this into some context, we're going <clears> to <throat> sort of keep this case in our mind. This is a patient that, um, you know, not unlike patients that I see here in, in San Francisco, 67-year-old man, Spanish-speaking, presents to clinic with concerns of memory loss in the setting of a four-year history of homelessness, has a longer history of debilitating arthritis of the hips and knees, um, has only three years of elementary school education. He doesn't have any relatives here in California, doesn't have close friends anymore, and he cannot remember the last time that he saw a health provider. This is very challenging, right? So how do you conduct a CHA? How do you go through these three elements of a cognitive health screen uh, uh, for a patient like this. Uh, and so we're highlighting here language barriers. I think it's pretty obvious how language becomes an impediment, especially if you're operating in a clinic, you're working in a clinic that doesn't have interpreters. What do you do with, about that? Uh, another potential barrier to conducting a good cognitive health assessment is homelessness, because most of the functional ability screening questions are very relevant to people that are housed like you know, finances, bathing, and, and all kinds of activities that we do in our home and day-to-day -day life. So how do you modify those questions for someone that hasn't been housed in many years? How do you assess functional abilities in someone that has been living in shelters or in the streets even for years? Um, we highlight debilitating arthritis or any other physical ail ailment because that too can become a potential barrier when you're doing a cognitive health assessment because what you're interested in capturing is how independent this person is compared to baseline, right? But if the person's baseline is already kind of low because of physical impediments that the person has been living with for many years, well, that wouldn't count into your CHA because you're interested in picking up on changes to functional abilities that are driven by the cognitive issues that you're, you're uh, evaluating. So that's the other factor here that we're trying to highlight. We highlight in this case the issue of low educational attainment. That complicates mostly the um, cognitive screen that you pick to use. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna touch on this a little bit uh, ahead. But for example, you know, people that are uh, illiterate or have very low literacy are gonna have trouble with intersecting pentagons, and they're gonna have trouble drawing a clock, not because they're visually or visual spatially impaired, but because those are tasks and, and activities that you really learn through school. Uh, how to do how to do three dimensional drawings, how to do even like two dimensional drawings, and if you haven't been exposed to that, they're going to be challenging to you at baseline, and they're not 
really a manifestation of cognitive impairment, but rather of your baseline abilities. Um, and then the issue of like loneliness and isolation, right? Which as I showed you before is a risk factor for neurodegenerative disease, but it also becomes an impediment to getting a good history or a good, good assessment for someone when there's no one that can serve as a reporter for you. So we we um, we narrowed down sort of a I think this is it's debatable as to how much how how many strategies one can come up with and and we'd love to hear your thoughts too as to things that you may already be doing in your practice to um, respond to these individual patient characteristics that become barriers, but we thought of of highlighting these three right that um, it's important to establish a baseline. Um, and what, what does that mean? That even, even in the setting where you're not sure that your cognitive screen is the right one, there is a language barrier, you don't have a good collateral. We think, I think that there's still things that you can do in that visit that help you construct a baseline for your patient that you can then compare to in six months or a year even, right? If you're concerned that there's something going on based on what you're hearing. So that's the main point there, that I don't think that it's, um, uh, I think we shouldn't give up basically and say, okay, this is just too hard. This is too complicated. I'm never gonna be, I can't rely on these tests, fine. You may not feel that you're gonna be able to do a good, reliable, trustworthy assessment right there cross-sectionally, but whatever you do on that visit is gonna serve you in the future because you're gonna be able to compare back and say, okay, things have changed. Now I'm more worried that you may have something progressive like Alzheimer's, for example. The second point I already alluded to, which is be flexible, right? You're not gonna be, fle I, what, what I would say is don't be flexible around tr doing your best to, to cover those three elements, history, functional abilities, and cognitive screen. And also the fourth one, I would say, like making your best effort to get someone that, to, to see if there is a, a care partner. But the three, the, the first three, especially, I would say, because you need those first three to, to make a complete assessment of cognition. Um, although you have to be rigid about that, there's ample flexibility as to how you evaluate each, right? So for example, uh, you can, in your clinic, in your busy practice, you may have like, I don't know, an MA or an MA or someone in your clinic collect a history over the phone, like before the visit. And then you, when you see the patient, you focus only on the cognitive uh, screen that day. And then you see them again in three months and you pick up some information about functional abilities. Uh, so it doesn't have to be all at the same time. It doesn't have to be all using the same instruments. You have to adapt them to the person that you're meeting. Um, <clears throat> and you don't have to be the person that does it all. It could be broken down into uh, different uh, team members. The third point is also important because we understand that, that and I see this in my, in my clinics even where I, you get stumped, right? You're like, okay, I, I just can't, I don't trust this. I feel like uh, I'm not gonna be able to even be able to get a good baseline that I can trust in the future. So I need to refer, I need to refer to a, a neuropsychologist that this is all they do, right? And they're, they're looking at these, at these individual patient characteristics and, and figuring out how to circumvent them so you can get a good reliable neuro or cognitive assessment. Um, you can refer to a, uh, a specialist like me, like a behavioral neurologist, because you know maybe your, your clinical assessment is not really convincing you of, of something specific, but you're still very worried. And, and then maybe I see this person in my clinic and I can say, you know what, we're gonna circumvent much of the clinical assessment because it's untrustworthy. We're gonna jump straight to the biomarkers. We're gonna do like Alzheimer's disease biomarkers because there's clearly something going on. That's just one example, um, and and so forth. There's other other uh, other uh, subspecialists that could be very helpful in very difficult cases. So, to hone in a little bit more on these on these strategies, right? Um, I already alluded to this, but I think it's important to really uh, let it sink in that even in the setting that you feel like your assessment is not giving you good information, it's still going to be useful in the future. Uh, these are some questions that you want to ask, right? You know, a, a basic question that I often ask in persons where I'm not sure is like, well, compare yourself now to how you were five years ago. Do you see a change? Do you feel like things have changed in the way your mind is working, your memory is working? 
And if the answer is yes, the next follow-up question is, are you worried about this? I think that question to me is key because it's like any other complaint, right? We may have a little pain, but I'm not so worried about it. I'm just gonna let it, I'm gonna keep you know, observing it and see what happens. But I think that that sense of worry is very important because it says, it says to you obviously that, okay, this person is not only noticing a change, but they're worried. They think that it, and that means that it goes beyond what they would expect to be normal for their age, for example. We all have a sense of what is normal for our age. Um, so that's the, 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 um, the point of that question in terms of like gauging cognition in general. Um, the same, same can be asked about functioning ability, functional abilities. Um, this becomes very important in, in persons, again, where, you know, re, this, despite your best efforts, you feel like you're not going to be able to do a good cognitive assessment. Well, then you can fall back on functional abilities. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, here in San Francisco, I see uh, persons that ha are illiterate or have one, two years of education. They come from a rural area of a Central American country. There's no norms. There's no norms that you're going to feel like cognitive health norms. And you're like, okay, yeah, I'm confident that they score on below this cutoff and they have dementia. No, that's that's not true. That's not possible. So, um, and so I'm not going to trust my cognitive screen because they're going to bomb it, right? And so what I'm more interested in looking at in that person is how, how, how have their functional abilities changed over time? So the questions are not so much around how you feel cognitively, but more of, okay, tell me what you used to do five years ago that you're not able to do now and why? Uh, why do you think that's the case? Is it physical or is it more cognitive? And that's another way that you can get a sense of a, of a cognitive disorder going on. Um, honing in more on this, on this idea of being flexible, I think a lot of this comes down to also planning a little bit ahead of time. You got to think of the patient that you're going to meet, ideally before the visit um, or in a second visit after you've met them, actually, and think of those individual characteristics or circumstances that will influence the way you do a cognitive health assessment and then do your best to adjust to them, right? So you can get a good baseline and neurocognitive assessment. Um, and like I said, you know, you don't have to do all components of the CHA, those the three or the four components, actually. You don't have to do the four components in one visit. It can be spread out. It can be uh, uh, different team members that does it. But the idea is that all of these data points come together and they give you a pretty good picture of what's going on cognitively. Um, the third point, also important, right? The fact that you're used to doing the MOCA doesn't mean that you're going to be doing it in every person that you see. Uh, it's very tempting to do that, but you're going to be thrown off for the reasons that I already said. Um, I have many patients that, like I said, they, they're always scoring terribly on the MOCA, but they're doing great functionally. What do I do about that? I'm not going to tell them they're demented because they're scoring like, a, I don't know, a 12 on the MOCA but they're still working, they're still taking care of their kids, they're still super functional. That's, that's more an issue of a baseline um, um, characteristics, really. And so you have to find a cognitive assessment that has been validated in people with low educational attainment or in illiterate people. And we're gonna be uploading some of these screens um, to the website so that we have those at our disposal. And the, the last point, it brings us back to the issue of, we can think of that case I, I brought up at the beginning, you know, someone that is experiencing homelessness, um, you're, it, it wouldn't make sense to do a screen of functional abilities that is tailored to a highly affluent individuals that are housed. And you're asking about, can you do your taxes? You know, that's obvious. So you know, those are questions that you need to modify. There are some functional screens. I know of one actually that has been validated validated in people that are homeless uh, that ask questions that are more pertinent to their lived experiences. Um, and again, it's all about first establishing what is their baseline and then getting a sense of how much their functional abilities have changed from that baseline. The issue of, of using specialist referrals, we, we, we think of three main ones, but I'm sure you can think of others. Um, a, you know, like I said before, if you're meeting someone that has a, a constellation of characteristics or circumstances that make it impossible for you to do a CHA 
a cognitive health screen that you feel comfortable with, then that's a good reason to find a subspecialty clinic. Uh, you know, and we have those clinics throughout the state. In our clinic, we have neuropsychologists that know how to uh, uh, do this, uh, uh, neurologists and geriatricians. That you know, this is all they do, and um, and we figure out ways to get a good baseline examination of, of on these patients. Um, if you don't trust your adapted version of the CHA, you make your best effort at picking up the tools and the approach to get a good cognitive health assessment. You feel that you're getting good data, but you're still worried. You're worried. You don't want to wait, right? You're like, I already did my assessment. These are the results that it's throwing me. Um, I'm concerned, and I don't, I don't feel like this can't wait, right? I don't want to wait six months to see if there's a change. Well, that may be a good reason to refer, to start the referral process at least. Um, and this one relates to a third point where you're doing a CHA, you're focusing on cognition, you have a good adaptive CHA, you have data that you trust, that you feel like you trust, but on the side, you're seeing signs and symptoms that are worrisome to you, changes in gait, an odd behavior, an odd demeanor, um, uh, examples of what the DSM-5 refers to uh, a social cognition being off, behaving inappropriately in public, um, a tremor, a sense that the person is just sitting there and not moving, like very bradykinetic, like very rigid, a uh, flat affect. Those are signs that may indicate something else going on that you, you may want uh, to have a, a specialist uh, evaluate. So returning to this case, again, we've already talked about some of the, the uh, issues and how these factors can become barriers to uh, conducting a CHA and, and the importance of still doing your best yeah, to address these factors and, and move forward. And, and, and because even in, in the worst case scenario, scenario uh, your best effort is going to serve as a good baseline for that person. Um, so let's talk a little bit about other barriers. We talked about English, right? So very common for uh, people living in California, Californians that are not English speakers um, or are bilingual and they feel more comfortable with one language, obviously, than the other. Uh, just a few points to keep in mind, as many of you know, or most of you know, uh, family members uh, or friends cannot be used as interpreters, but they can be collaterals, right? They can be informants of a, of a patient. They can help you get a sense of how things have changed over time, both cognitively and functionally. And obviously, they can also become your uh, the persons that you document as care partners. Um, and in the absence of family and close friends, a health provider may be able to help uh, getting the history and the functional screen. That's the main point here, that uh, even though you may be working in a setting where maybe that day um, there is a scarcity of, of interpreters, because that's what you would you would preferably need, of course, and, and if possible, an in-person interpreter, um, they can still help you get a, a picture of the patient that can serve as a baseline in the future, obviously. Um, I already said this. Ideally, you want to you want to um, you want to be able to have an in-person interpreter. I know that's extremely challenging. It's challenging even in a city like San Francisco. I, I saw uh, patients today in Chinatown and, and I could not have an in-person interpreter. Uh, so we it was all through the phone. Um, uh, the, the value of having an in-person interpreter is that, you know, there's, there's things that the interpreter may be seeing that may be able to highlight. There's body language that can be interpreted as well that may be uh, important to highlight. I've had interpreters comment on, for instance, um, changes in language, uh, prosody of speech, um, word choice that the interpreter found interesting or even concerning or odd. Uh, and those are neurological signs. So uh, that's also why obviously an interpreter is important. Um, so we touched on this. Uh, and, and what about if, if you cannot find uh, family members uh, that, or like that patient I, I shared, right? Uh, someone that has been homeless, um, 
that has been sort of disconnected from their community. Uh, you have no one to fall back on for uh, collateral history. Well, maybe health providers that know the person could be that collateral history. Uh, people that work in, in different um, facilities that, that this homeless person is visiting. Um, I've, I, I've relied on that, where, uh, both Anna and I have relied on that where, when we're seeing people that are experiencing homelessness, we may call someone in the shelter to get a sense of, you know, you've known this person for three, four years. Are you noticing a change in how this person is behaving, what he or she is able to do? Uh, because I'm not able to get much of a history from him or her now. And so you 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 have to get creative around that as well. Um, and we're gonna we're, and the last point, uh, as I said before, we're going to be uploading different screening tools for both for cognitive screens and functional screens in different languages in the website. So those are handy. Um, I Anna introduced me to this thing. I thought it was great. And uh, now uh, we we have it here in our clinic too, but uh, in people that are hard of hearing, you can wear this device and amplify their hearing, and you can use it through the hearing. It's very useful, cheap, easy to carry, super useful. Um, the last thing you want is to be screaming off the top of your lungs to try to get a history from someone that is hard of hearing. We've had that happen. At the end, you end up with a sore throat from trying to get a history from someone that cannot hear you, and you got to be screaming. <clears throat> Um, so now the issue of learning challenges, and here we're, we're talking about not only people that have developmental differences, but also people that have low educational attainment and therefore have low health literacy. Um, uh, you got to try to find, we have to always try to find the cognitive screen that is appropriate for the level of literacy of your patient. Uh, as I said before, the MOCA, MMSC are not ideal. They're always going to give you low scores. And if you take them at face value, you're going to be super worried because you're seeing someone that has a score of 15. Uh, but then you collect the history and it seems like the family's not worried, the person is not worried. So what do you do about that? Well, probably that this is just not good for your patient because they've never driven a clock in their life. And you'll be surprised. You know, people are surprised. They're like They know how to read the time, but they can't draw a clock. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily that they're cognitively impaired. And by the way, I, I can speak a little bit further about this because I'm originally from Peru. I have colleagues with whom I'm doing research in Peru in remote areas of the country uh, where low educational attainment is very common. And it's extremely common for people to be unable to draw copy complex figures, um, people that are healthy, that are living their lives normally. And um, so that's the issue that, that we have, I think, here in California that is home to uh, people that come from all over uh, Central and South America, from usually from vulnerable remote regions of these countries. And so you need to be aware of that when you're evaluating them. Um, so, and, and people, when you're doing a functional screen, even in people that have learning challenges, I think a similar approach, uh, as I mentioned before, to someone that is homeless may come in handy, right? Because what do I mean by that? Well, um, people that have very low educational attainment, uh, they may be, you know, they, they may be living in a, in a situation that does not require highly complex level of um, activities, like it, it, which is what most of these screeners ask, you know, again, taxes, complex finances, and things like that. So those questions may not be relevant to people that um, have very low, low educational attainment or people that, that have developmental uh, learning challenges. Um, this other point is also very important, you know, what do you do in someone that you don't feel you can trust a cognitive screen that has visual inputs, we'll try to stick to the verbal stuff um, because uh, things that involve pictures are going to be very difficult for them. So you want to test more of the verbal memory than the visual memory. Um, you know, you can't rely on tests that, that are going to be probing into arith arithmetic and math skills, even if it's the simplest math skills. So you have to figure out a way of getting that baseline that you need that then you're going to be you're going to use to compare to in the future. Um, and 
the issue of physical disabilities is very important, right? Because um, I've seen uh, this is, I think I, I see this, I've seen this happening in, in for instance, in resident clinic, uh, where they they will um, come to me with a case and they'll say, yeah, but he's he already has compromise of his, of his, of his uh, ADLs. Uh, he needs help, uh, you know, showering. And I'm like, well, but why? Well, he's got some, well, okay, so that's not an issue that pertains to the cognitive syndrome that you're telling me about. That's a baseline difficulty with uh, basic ADLs related to some orthopedic issue. So it's important to just make that distinction that what you're looking at are changes in functional abilities, both ADLs and IADLs that um, are being driven by that by the cognitive illness that you're you think you're capturing here. Um, so be careful with that. And um, and I already, I already touched about this on this, but uh, you know, if the person's living situation is not stable, they're unsheltered, you can still do a CHA, but you got to be careful when you're asking about functional abilities. As I said already many times that these functional uh, screening tools are, are not designed to, to assess homelessness. So you got to be careful about that. And just to wrap things up, um, these are just some of the screening tools that we um, are going to be uploading to our website that you can use uh, the GP cog, the mini cog that are directed at the patient. They're all brief. They come in different languages. You can also assess cognition through a, a partner. Um, these are some examples also available in different languages. And these are just some screens that you can use to test functional abilities, a key component of any neurocognitive assessment. So you can decide if your person, that person that you're seeing has more an MCI level of impairment or has more a dementia level of impairment, even before you start to think about the causes. So some take home points, our state is extremely diverse, not only racially, ethnically, but across many uh, patient characteristics or people characteristics that um, can affect clinical evaluations, obviously, and, and specifically can affect your ability to do a CHA. You have to be aware of that and try to adjust your clinic to those characteristics. Uh, when all else fails and you feel like you're not gonna get a good uh, immediate cross-sectional assessment, just do your best to establish a baseline, trying to cover those three components, four components, and then that's gonna serve as your comparison in the future. Uh, to do this, we have to stay practical and we have to stay flexible to a large extent, meaning that I have to have a good arsenal of tools and approaches that I'm gonna be using to tap into cognition and to functional abilities, abilities and to get a history. And remember what I said earlier that if you feel like you you can't rely on cognition because you're not able to get a good history and there's, for instance, low educational attainment, then shift your focus to functional abilities that are due to cognitive change, and that's going to give you a sense of change over time. And always keep in mind that there are referral that, that there are spe subspecialists, obviously, throughout the state that may be able to help you. I know that some clinics are very far away. Um, we also have Alzheimer's disease research centers throughout the state that do very comprehensive. Um, uh, we have one here that we do very comprehensive neurocognitive assessments, even in people that are illiterate, and we follow them longitudinally. That can be an another valuable source of referral um, uh, throughout the state. Uh, we have uh, the ability to conduct these assessments in Spanish, in Chinese, and in English, and so do other uh, ADRCs in the state. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me. And I think we have plenty of time for discussion. Yeah, we do. We had some great questions. Um, I don't know if you want to, let's see. Um, yeah, you could just go to the next slide and we'll just sort of keep that up. I think it's the Q&A one. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you, Sergio. I think obviously you had a really big job to try to bring together essentially what are incredibly diverse reasons for affecting these assessments. And um, I think I know a lot of us clinically, when we're starting out with um, with these assessments, um, yeah, thank you. Um, we can, we often already go to like, well, what's next? Like, how am I going to get more information? And so, you know, I think that was 
just extremely practical to weave that all in. Mm -hmm. um, I want to remind everybody, like this will be up on the our YouTube channel and the other webinars we've done are up there as well. Um, so we'll put that in the chat in terms of um, if you can't find it through our website, but, um, and if you wanna watch this again, but I think to summarize like a lot of what I saw in the Q and A, um, people were uh, sort of asking, I think and it's hard not to, to be really focused on, well, okay, but what are the tools I could be using that are better? And I think particularly around very low literacy and then different languages. So I'll give you some examples of questions and and see what opinions you have. Um, someone brought up the the Tabcat, which for those who don't know is a tablet based assessment. It's I think you can either help the person administer it or it can be guided or I think ideally it would be self administered. Um, it is being implemented across locally across UCSF and a lot of other sites um, and and partly in like trial implementation kind of setting. Um, but the question was more around like, well, when would you use something like that? And what is the population? And I think generally the big message of dementia care where and the state, you know, the Department of Public Health and other entities would be at this point, people 65 and older should have some annual assessment of cognition. And if we're really get trying to get anywhere near dementia under an understanding of people have dementia or MCI, we, we need a functional assessment too. So that's why the cognitive health assessment kind of packages that together. Mm -hmm. um, but the TABCAT itself, I would say people 65 and, and older, That my guess is that would be the general approach. Um, and then when do we use other things like MOCA came out, the MOCA group. And again, if you look at our cognitive health assessment tools for screening, we picked really simple screens, which are less biased in lower literacy populations, but they're not they're not perfect. And they're certainly not perfect for people who have severe vision impairment, or as you pointed out, uh, Sergio, like neither the GP cog, which is one recommended tool, or the mini cog, which is a clock draw as has a clock draw as well. Like neither of those would be great in the population that you're seeing in in rural Peru, and which I'm sure we have patients here in in um, California from. Yeah. So do you have like and I, I would put it more in the realm of screening or like brief assessment. Do you have preferred tools or any tips and tricks? I know the one, the main way I've used the modified MOCAs is in somebody who has like a decent amount of education, but not high school um, and maybe not, you know, Western based education, or I've used the one for blind individuals. I found that to be helpful if they're blind and yeah. um, do have more education, but yeah, any additional yeah. thoughts? Additionally, I mean, most of the uh, patients I see here in community sites are Spanish speaking. That's my primary language. So I, I make myself available to those patients, and most of them come from very low educational backgrounds, highly vulnerable, um, <clears throat> and it's very challenging. I think what I end up doing oftentimes is I, I pick based on my interaction with the patient and you know, I start all of my interviews basically trying to get to know the person first before I even jump into cognition. But I have to admit that I have the luxury of time that I know that many, many primary care doctors don't have. Um, and I get a sense of what are, you know, their background, right? And, and then I, I pick the uh, cognitive assessment. Sometimes it's based on bedside uh, things that I've learned in my practice. Uh, and I don't necessarily pick like a full instrument. One that, I, that I've been using recently because my colleagues in Peru have been using it in rural areas is the RUDAS, R-U-D-A-S, mm -hmm. which has been validated in Spanish in people with low literacy and illiterate uh, persons. Um, it's not a perfect test, but I think it is one, if you want me to name a specific one. Um, but I also, uh, I guess, have the advantage in a way that you know, in the in the ADRC here, even in the what we're finding is that even in people with low, not illiterate, but low educational attainment, the battery that we use here, which includes like a, a word learning uh, task and some simple executive tasks, gives meaningful information. So I use that as well when I see patients sometimes, um, and I use the MOCA also sometimes when I feel like I'm meeting someone that you know has a good amount of education. They're like maybe not fully finished high school, but uh, they're they're up there. And maybe they've had a job where 
it, it where they they have been doing these skills like you know not drawing cubes but um, you know visual spatially stimulating tasks you know numerical in their in their job um, then I say okay maybe this is going to give me some reliable information but the the truth is like I said in, in during the talk like there aren't there, you're not going to find like a battery or a little test that you're that you know 100 is going to be good for your patient that comes from a remote uh, town of South America, Central America, or Mexico. And so I think there you're going to have to fall back on, let me do the best I can with what I know to do, you know, considering seating and, and uh, floor effects. And, and um, I'm going to measure this through time. It's going to be like my assessment, which is the approach I take, because that's what we do in neurology in general. You measure strength, you know, you give it a number, and then you see how it changes over time. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same approach. Yeah, I think something you really emphasized um, and I think helps us like ground just in practical, you know, a practical approach is using the person as a baseline. So you get some information, you're not mm -hmm. sure what to make out of it. And this is where time as a diagnostic aid really helps us. Like we have this benefit of longitudinality with the person. We can reassess if really nothing's changing. Doesn't mean it never will, but it makes it less likely that, you know, something is going on at least in the interim year. Um, and then this other emphasis you put on function, you know, if we're really, if the, if the scoring around a brief cognitive screen at the, you know, sort of screening stage or the scoring, even at the more in-depth evaluation is kind of not, you know, is suggesting some, that there's some deficits, but then function is just stable and, um, and appropriate, like, and the other, the other whatever factor, their abilities are, it sort of kind of tells you a lot there too. Yeah. And the other point I wanted to make that I didn't make in the talk is that the, another challenge with these brief cognitive assessment tools is that many of them are highly reliant on region or culture specific factors, um, like the words that are used, mm -hmm. right? And and so this brings me to, you mentioned the TAPCAD. Well, the TAPCAD, I think the strength of the TAPCAD if for a brief cognitive, one of the strengths is that it has been designed with with a goal of like trying to make it as minimally dependent on culture and specific uh, background factors as possible, knowing mm -hmm. that it's impossible to have something that is completely new. So, for example, when when uh, Dr. Pocine and and her team and, and I participated in this process too, we're developing the Spanish version. Like we got. A, a group of like people, physicians and providers from different parts of Latin America to weigh in on the words and make sure that, you know, they were identifiable in different uh, regions, right? So mm -hmm. we went through that effort and, and it relies on tasks that are not highly dependent on education or culture. That's, and it's proven to be pretty, a pretty good test. So mm -hmm. a really great test actually so far. So that's yeah. something to consider as well, for sure. Yeah, I think the big picture, I know what the TabCat is, it's like right now it is, and this can be a totally fine because it's often the patient doing it and the provider isn't having to administer it, but it can be a little long. So like, it's definitely longer than, you know, it many times, but it would, yeah. the practical aspect of that would be they're doing it in, you know, the waiting room or somewhere else where, um, and not taking up the visit time. Um, mm -hmm. I'll address a couple of questions just really quick and you can correct me, Sergio, or, or add to it. Um, we already talked about how the clock is tough. And so the mini cog really relies on that. My understanding, and I've seen it in a couple of things that there's a word list or sorry, an animal list that you can ask people for as an alternative to the clock. So it's like a three item recall and a, asking people to name animals. And then it has a cutoff, um, like as many animals as they can. In that's a, a good one. The animals, um, that's another interesting situation, right? I mean, I don't know if you've encountered this too, but when I do like the mocha, for example, Many people don't know what a hippopotamus is. Yeah. They, they feel like they say it's a bull. Or, or a rhino. Yeah, they're exotic. Yeah. And they're all exotic animals. Yeah. They're all exotic animals. And, and again, if you don't go to school, you don't get to see them. Yeah. It's well, so, about so them, specific. I and I think actually the specificity you're pointing out, even about word choice for certain translations would like kind of makes it problematic for these mega translations. So a mocha that has, you know, I know they have different versions for different um, areas of um, Chinese, like big Chinese language speaking areas like Hong Kong versus, um, I think they call it traditional or something, but, or maybe Beijing. But um, in any case, that, that oh, was yeah. a really good point. And then somebody says, um, uh, 
makes a great point about like the the role of the social work. And I will say one thing we did not address well over the course of the um, conversation is that other team members may be doing parts of the assessment. Oh, that yeah. would be totally, yeah, totally awesome and totally appropriate, and of course incredibly useful. But they may be able to get more detail on the functional piece that like this is baseline has been baseline for twenty years since a you know right. TBI while they after they were riding their bike or something. Um, so that was really a really good point. Um, and then somebody else asks again, like a good strategy for patients who are developmentally delayed, especially if there's nobody there to give you a baseline. Mm -hmm. So I, so like, imagine wow. we're seeing somebody developmentally, developmentally delayed, you know, there's a, it's a positive screen. It's not normal. There's yeah. no collateral. That's like tough. That's super tough. And I, I don't, I can't say that I'm experienced in evaluating people uh, with developmental delays. I don't have a lot of, ex I don't have experience, I should say, but just picturing that scenario, I, it would be very tough. I would say that you're seeing someone with a developmental delay and you don't have anybody that you can fall back on to give you a sense of time, you know, changes over time. Then I think you have two options. If you don't, um, if you're meeting this person and clinically you're, you're not seeing signs that are obviously worrisome to you, you could mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to do my best on this assessment and then see this person back in three, four months. Um, you know, check labs, make sure I don't, I can identify anything metabolic, toxic going on. Uh, maybe even do an MR or a CT scan at least, you know, to rule out something structural and then see them again and see if I'm meeting the same person or if I'm meeting a new person, stay in touch. But if you're seeing something that doesn't feel right, that is a good reason to refer mm -hmm. to a subspecialty clinic. We, for instance, we have a provider here that has been seeing uh, persons with Down syndrome that have cognitive changes. She's been doing this for many years. She has a good feel for, mm -hmm. for it's a good sense. And I think that's invaluable, right? It's like having those persons to fall back on. Yeah. And I have a huge favor to ask, which is if you can put up the slide with the CME information so people can yeah. um, use their QR codes or or claim it. Um, Where is that? Here? Okay. I think it's, uh, well, that's the warm language we always want people to know about. And that, like I would say, if you have a question about one of these patients, um, you could call the warm line and talk to one of our consultants, but next slide, let's see, it should be, okay. yeah, um, I think that's it. And uh, it's also going in the chat. Um, I think the other thing you're pointing out in that scenario, just to reflect back on is mm. you have an assessment, you know, if, to, to hedge your bets clinically, you could continue to do further evaluation. I would say you could really emphasize supporting that person's, you know, functional needs and brain health in the meantime. And then as time is going on, right. you're going to be learning more. You're going to be comparing to their own baseline. Correct. That might be one way to, to just, you know, as we are all trying to do every day, like do yeah. your best supporting that person. Yeah. We didn't talk to, we didn't talk about all of that in this presentation because it was mostly focused on the assessment piece, but yes, there's a lot that needs to be done to uh, try to find underlying causes or factors that are contributing to cognitive impairment, be it MCI or dementia level of impairment, um, that you can be doing in the meantime while you follow this person longitudinally. Um, last point I would make is that, you know, a, is to ask us to not conflate dementia with Alzheimer's, dementia with a neurodegenerative disease. I think keeping that in mind is helpful because you know, we are we are talking about doing that first step in the assessment that allows you to determine if this person has dementia level of cognitive impairment or not, or if they have more MCI. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that process is separate from what happens next, which is, okay, now why? Why is my yeah. patient having these issues? And Thank you, Sergio. Yeah. I'm sorry that we're out of time, but that was an amazing, um, okay. amazing amount of time for presentation. If you go to the next slide, we'll just make sure to plug our next webinar, which is only in a couple of weeks about thinking a little more deeply about mental illness and uh, pieces of the cognitive health assessment and next steps. Um, we also, of course, we know that there's a ton of questions. These are all really big topics. So we welcome additional questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to absolutely all of them, but please check out our additional materials and call us or email us anytime. Um, we really want to help people make their way through these assessments or thinking through how they would implement the cognitive health assessment. So very grateful to you, Sergio. Thank you so Thank much. You. This was a terrific presentation and have a wonderful mm -hmm. weekend. Ciao, ciao. Thanks.